Farm for Profit Podcast. Take a listen, have a blast. Farm for Profit Podcast. Learn about farming while having a laugh. Farm for Profit Podcast. All right. So we uh, are going to have a little bit of an introduction here for our listeners. So that way we can get this conversation kicked off. We thank every one of our listeners for jumping on the podcast. This is a Farm for Fun episode. Corey, Dave, and myself, Tanner, sitting here in our studio in Slater, Iowa, Studio 205, are having a virtual conversation with some friends in Florida, which uh, are apparently experiencing a lot nicer weather than we're having right here i was told our podcast needs to not have an introduction we just start right into it like joe rogan and if you're willing to stick on board you're going to figure it out see that's the that's the fun part is you know we take a lot of feedback from a lot of different people and we don't always listen (laughs) Uh, you know the amount of people that were mad that we got rid of the song the intro song yeah so it's then, back ish and then we threw it back in and one i got like three texts like oh my gosh you put it back in yeah it's it's quite <laughs> interesting because then i get the feedback as to why are we back to the song and not using that cool intro that laughs saying oh i'm supposed to clap yeah. at the end you can't please everyone yeah. can't please everyone That's, change is good change is good yep that is exactly how things go but uh we like to kick off all of our podcast episodes that are farm for funds with a little bit of an introduction so we're going to get that fired up here for uh, you're gonna have to scroll there too our listeners of the day so uh, get that royalty free music going you know this one comes with a beat that drops oh yeah put it up a little higher sure i'll just go Today on the Farm for Fun show, we are in studio, but virtual. We head back on memory lane to a warm, sweet trip last November down to Florida. When I think of John Deere, I don't normally think of palm trees, beaches, sugar, alligators, and golf courses, but this is exactly what surrounds one of the world's largest John Deere dealers. 18 locations covering central and southern Florida. Family owned and operated. Established in 1963. Please welcome the team behind the dream, Mike and Bo Schlechter. <laughs> I, I should have asked before. <laughs> Did that I say that say right? That? <laughs> <laughs> welcome. Very good. Actually, it was very good. Very welcome, good. guys. I'm glad I didn't butcher that. That was a bad host uh, of me <laughs> not to uh, ask how that was pronounced. But you guys could be on a golf course or in the pool right now. It's uh, probably about 5 o'clock there. Um, but yeah, welcome yes, to the show. it is. Welcome to the show. How are you guys doing? Doing well, doing well. Glad to be here, guys. Glad so, to be here. So, Mike, you are the owner, CEO? I, I am the president and part of the family that uh, owns Everglades Equipment Group. So my grandfather started it with two other gentlemen in 1963, and then my father bought him out in probably seven or eight years later. And then it's myself, and I have two brothers, and my parents are still involved in the ownership of the dealership. That's a family business. That is a family business. It is. It is a true family business. It's all the good and all of the all challenges. The bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of that, isn't there? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> is Bo part and of the now I have I have my son and my daughter involved in the business, and one of my son, one of my brother's sons, is involved in the business. So it is. We're kind of all through all through the. Uh, through the dealership, so it's good. Like I said, it's got it's got its good and it's got its challenges. Yeah, yeah. So, Bo, are you? Where do you come into the picture here? So I'm Mike's son, and I'm currently working for Mike. <laughs> and uh, man, I've got my similar to Mike's upbringing in in the company. Uh, I'm in my seventh year, and I kind of in I'm, I'm involved in many different departments right now, and. Uh, I kind of am more of the, the on the digital side of things. Yep. So it's it's pretty interesting concept because where he said my grandfather started it and that was more about fixing tractors and Bell Glade, large agricultural tractors. And then where my dad, Mike, kind of took it from one to 18 locations. It was a growth stage. And, and now I feel like I'm stepping in and, and really trying to put digital processes together now that obviously everybody knows and 2024 that's kind of what businesses are trying to do right now to optimize and strategize digitally so i got a great opportunity and um i'm blessed to be a part of it if i remember right you you started a podcast didn't you 
Yes, we did. The Big Ag Show. The Big Ag Show, on, yeah. Guys. I might just send you guys some hats there. I need and one And you of can those. see I put the signs up of Everglades so we can make sure we get some advertising. Going That's very in. good. Absolutely. See? Digital expert right here. <laughs> yeah. I know yeah. none of us have the shirt on, but we all got a polo for your 60, I think it was your 60th anniversary when we were down on the sugar trip. And it is by far one of the best shirts that we all we all love. Yeah. It, right, my, it fits great. My it daughters great. love it. My daughter's like, "Hey, Dad, are you wearing a tractor shirt today?" <laughs> and I think There's we all about the shirts and hats. I think we all feared that we were someone else is going to wear, <laughs> wear it today, <laughs> so none of us wore it. <laughs> yeah, I do. This is my number one hat. The my I've got the Everglades hat on, and I this is the one that I will reach for. Yeah, I'm not just saying that to to say it. You guys have uh, great design taste. Yep. And uh, well, I think it really is funny. I was at a Marlins game Sunday and I was standing up where you could kind of see five levels down and uh, everybody was waiting in line for the kids to run the bases. And I was I spotted four Everglades hats amongst nice. the mile long uh, line of people. That's well, f- farmers and le- they like hats. <laughs> who, who was it that we <laughs> ran right. into at Commodity? I can't remember their name, but we were at the John Deere release event at Commodity. I think you guys had two employees there. Yeah, and, our corporate, uh, corporate sales manager David Lively and Jeremy Nipper, with our our division uh, yep. ag manager, were there. So I wore my Everglades shirt to the release, and they and they were like, uh, "Who in the what? world is yeah, that?" There's only two of us here. <laughs> what the heck's going on? <laughs> How in the they world? They told us about it. They were like, "What in the where in the world did that come from?" So that was hey, well, gets around now. Yeah, good shirt gets around. Yep. And I got to say, just while we're on the subject, for no reason, I have to tell you this quick story. I was in uh, <laughs> I was in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, about two years ago. And we were hiking through the woods in Gatlinburg, <laughs> Tennessee. And my, uh, my little nephew stumbled across this dirty hat that he literally had to pull out of the mud in the bushes. And it was an Everglades farm equipment hat. No and way. And I thought that was amazing. I you thought you were going to say that you were hiking in an Everglades polo. And I'm like, why would you hike in a polo? Yeah. All I had was no, no. that song. It was Gatlinburg in mid-July. I knew I had to get tough or die. Yeah. I found an Everglades hat while hiking. <laughs> <laughs> Great. You sounded so good there. We're probably going to get a copyright issue. Yeah, yeah probably. I like it. Yeah. Yeah, That's great. Great. All right, so give us an idea of what kind of customers you guys are serving down there in Florida. Because, you know, a lot of our listeners are Midwest-based. We've picked up pockets from the sugar trip and our trip to out in uh, to Larry, California. But but ultimately, give us a scope. What kind of equipment are you selling to? Well, I, I, I'll, uh, I'll catch this one, Bo. We, we, as he said, we started in sugar gang country. You know, and most people think of Florida, as you guys said. You're thinking of palm trees, beaches, you know, but, but, but when you put it in perspective in – 2003, I think it was, we sold more tractors than anybody. And that's 6,000, you know, uh, 6,007, 8, 9s sold more than anybody in the world. So when you think about the row crop aspect, when you look at the central part of the state and right up to the edges of the population, it is farming. And this this weather is absolutely incredible. And, and the crazy thing, it's it's opposite of you guys. You know, I mean, I, I grew up in Belgley, which is a, a little country town in the middle of Florida, you know, and I, it's funny, everybody, when I go places in West Palm Beach, they're like, man, where are you from? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm from Florida, and I'm a fourth generation Floridian, you know, but we get so much influx of different kind of people, but we started in, in pure ag. We have some of the largest pickle growers, some of the largest sweet corn growers east of the Mississippi. Sugar, obviously, you guys know, is a big oh, yeah. crop for us. Uh, citrus, obviously, big crop for us. And especially crops are, are big crops for us. Now, when we started expansion, all of a sudden, we were introduced to the coast. And the coast, obviously, is more commercial, uh, landscaping, all of those type products. So at one time, we were probably 95% of our revenue came from ag and 5% came from other things. In the last couple of years, that has, that has flopped to where we have probably 40, I think it's 45% is ag and 55% is non-ag. So that's governmental agencies, all the construction and, and those type, those different type things. So, so our customer base is really, really very, you know, diverse. So, I mean, I, I, I'm in groups with other dealer dealer groups and a lot of them are the midwest guys and they're all they're all big ag mm-hmm. 
Yeah. And I really tell them, guys, you need to be on your hands and knees every night thanking the good Lord that that's what you have. Because <laughs> that customer base is, I mean, they're tough, but, man, you really, you really understand that customer base. You know, when you start getting into government agencies, uh, small contractors, landscape contractors, they're – they're great guys. It's just, it's just so many of them you have to deal with, and it's so, so diverse how how they do business. So it, it, it you know, it brings its own set of challenges, but it's good stuff. Good Mike, stuff. I gotta ask. So uh, I own an auction company, and so I get to auction equipment, and every time I auction for a farmer, there's so much emotion attached to it because oh, that was Grandpa's tractor. Or, oh, that was our favorite, you know, uh, eighty four hundred or whatever it is. But then yeah. when I get to the construction guys in a skid loader, they're like, whatever, just sell it. We bought a whole new line of them. Here they are. They're, they're, it's just a line item. They've worn out. These are our hours. Go for it. And they really don't care what the money is because they've already upgraded by the time they did it. Right. Do you see that in your world too? I mean, it it's is construction. It is exactly now. Now I will say. And this is probably where our agriculture is a little different than you guys. We have more uh, contract labor and more oh, yeah, yeah. hired labor that operates the equipment. So we have, you know, commercial farms. We still have smaller farms, but they still have hired labor that operates the equipment. So you really, we probably don't have the heart string tied to that as much. Now, now I, Saying that there are items that they keep around that was from the initial farm, yep. from the original farm, you know. So they do have a little bit, but but our guys are a little different in in that it's the commercial aspect of it because they've went through a lot of consolidation in our area. So a lot of these guys are pretty pretty big farms. Like the two sugar guys are a couple hundred thousand acres of land that they farm each. So I mean it's just it's just massive when you start looking at it like that. So. What was it? The salad bowl for the rest of the world? Yeah, salad bowl of the <laughs> southeast. Eh? Yeah, salad bowl of the southeast is everything. Sugar, sugar capital and the salad bowl. Yeah. Everything they grow. And then yeah. he's got the construction side, so he's got all the mix in for the salad bowl too. I don't even know where you could go buy a piece of yellow construction John Deere equipment around here. I mean, I suppose Van Wall would sell it. Would order like it for a, like you. a backhoe or yeah, payloader. Yeah, you know, something like that, but. They do. Van Wall does. I know Van Wall. Yes, yeah. they they do. They would have that. <laughs> okay. I, I'm sure. You just but don't again, see it. It's just volumes. You know, it yeah, starts yeah. talking volumes. And you know, we actually added the golf line probably five years ago, and you know, it's been it's been excellent for us because it allows some of our smaller stores to be able to to have enough revenues to survive. Because it is in that market is really challenging. You know, the guys in the Midwest, you know, they're fifty. 60 they're million dollar stores they're they're big and much bigger than that so i mean it's it makes it it makes it when you start going at a smaller store it's really really challenging because the margins are tight the revenues are small and and look we went to i'm in naples and i'm going to try to i bought some land and we were going to build another store and i had been talking to a guy in georgia a dealer in georgia and he was complaining because he had to spend three hundred thousand dollars for 45 acres of land. And I'm telling you, I wanted to choke him because we bought, we bought seven acres for $3.1 million. Jeez. And and then, then we got a quote for the building for $8 million. Oh. And it's like, we're not even close to that. So let's just say we didn't, we didn't proceed with that project. <laughs> I'll just tell you that we went, we went a different route. So, but that, that's the challenge of, of another challenge in Florida is when you get to the, to the coast everything's so expensive to, you know to do business with it, it is it's tough so Bo, as you think about the family history i mean obviously you're probably extremely thankful that you're not still having family lineage lineage living in north dakota and you uh right. got to spend time up there but what how did you become a john deere dealer well it's funny, I know the we just spent two hours on a podcast recently talking to my granddad, talking all the way through that. And my dad could tell the story probably a lot better than me. But when um, my granddad came down, uh, or my great granddad came down, or Mike, just tell me if you want to tell this story because you love to tell it. <laughs> no, 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 it's good. Go ahead. I mean, I, I, I want to hear it from your perspective. That's good yeah. stuff. Well, I, I've heard it plenty. But my great granddad came down with his wife and I think roughly five kids in right around 1890 ish to South Florida from North Dakota. And um, he came down, I think, with, with an effort to farm in Belle Glade, Florida. 
And long story short, his uh, my great granddad, his wife, and three of their kids all died in um, a hurricane in I think it was nineteen twenty eight. Whoa! Wow! Yeah. <clears throat> Which for any listeners out there, if you look up the hurricane that happened in Belle Glade in nineteen twenty eight, it's like one of the worst um, catastrophes in United States history when you look at like death rate. Um, because it was basically a Category 5 hurricane that came in the middle of the night in 1928 where there really wasn't any news telling you that the hurricane's coming. And and on that note, is it is absolutely striking the amount of people that died. And, and these days, you just wouldn't understand how that could happen because, you know, we see hurricanes coming from, from miles and miles away. But in one night, I think it was, um, I mean, thousands of people died in Belgrade. But to, to, to kind of go back to what we were saying, so my grandfather was 21 at the time. He was farming up in North Dakota in the summer, uh, kind of in the summertime. And he got a wire message letting him know that his both his parents and three of his four siblings had died in one night in a hurricane. Jeez. And he, um, he came back. He was 21 years old. He came back and uh, he, he wrote a really powerful letter. Uh, back to his family in North Dakota, basically telling them, hey, guys, look, my dad came down here to farm. There's still promise. You know, there's still promise to be had down here. I'm going to stick it out. We're going to farm and uh, basically collected all the bodies. You know, Bell Glade for the next three weeks, they just collected bodies. And um, then he went back to work and he started farming and farmed. And and, and um, my th- that was actually my great granddad. So really, it was my great, great granddad that came down to North Dakota. Right. So then that's whenever my uh, my granddad was raised right there in Belle Glade, obviously farming. And they started a, and this is where it gets a little blurry, but they started some sort of tractor repair shop there in Belle Glade, um, where, you know, they're working on all the local farmers tractors or, you know, and what, what little of what was actually going on. And, um, and then I think at that point there was, there was a guy that was a really good sales. What was his name, Mike? Don. Don Williams. Yeah, there was a really good sales guy there who kind of came to my granddad who had had a repair shop and and basically came with the opportunity where, hey, there's, you know, John Deere's trying to get down into South Florida. Is that right? Yeah. Well, I mean, and my granddad had sold a farm. He, he had sold a farm. So he... uh he basically had a little money, and the and the sales guy, uh, one guy was a sales guy. Then then my uncle, my uncle had a barn, so they said let's do it. And you know, dealerships these days are really complicated things with technology and the things they throw at you. Let me tell you that, and this is probably universal. There's a time when there's a need, and people feel the need, whether that's in Florida, Iowa, wherever it is. So it was very simple. It was you know, it's three guys get together and said, hey man. We, we all have things to do and we can, let, let's get it started. So we, they can repair tractors, sell tractors. And it was a, it was a great place. You know, it was, uh, Florida where it is in, in, uh, around the lake is some of the most fertile soil in the world. I mean, it's black. It is absolutely unbelievable, but, but they just, they all said, Hey, let's do it. And, and from that point, it was, it was just a matter of continuing to do what they know how to do. And again, like I said, it, it went from, from one to a few, like in probably 2000, we started growing. Now, John Deere had a deal that said, they said, you either grow or you go. And we didn't, you know, I was still young. I didn't really want to go at that point. So I said, let's, you know, let's go. Let's grow. So we, uh, we went from one, one location to eight in one year. Whoa. And let me tell you something. That's one of those things when you think you want something and all of a sudden it gets thrown on your plate and you're like, wow, this is, this is something. But it, it listen, it's been good. You know, I told the sales guys when we were going through that, I said, you just keep selling. You sell things and we'll we'll make it work. Because if there's no if there's no revenue dollars, as you you guys well know, you out of business. Right. Yep. So hey look, the Lord's blessed, it's been good stuff. Good stuff. And I wanna I wanna point out that and this is one of the great lessons I got to learn from being in the family that did all this was we started they started that dealership in nineteen sixty three. Um it was one dealership hustling all the way until he said in 2000. Oh, wow. You know, a lot of yeah. people, a lot of people talk about, they see us today and they see 18 stores and like, man, it's all great. But, but really like you see for like 
40 years, this, this company was one dealership doing things on such a small scale and just really earning their reputation for 40 straight years where, where really it was a, um, because of that 40 years, I think I got to see, I was kind of, uh, I was like around 12 years old when I started to see them start to grow, you know, but, but there's such a lesson to be had there about, it takes a lot of time, a lot of time and a lot of doing the right thing over and over again. So Bo, you got all this equipment that you're around all the time and you're a social media guy. Uh, are you like the, going to apply for the chief tractor officer for John Deere and uh, <laughs> just, just give a video of every piece of equipment you're in and <laughs> Absolutely, man. <laughs> Everyone. I, I know Brock Purdy. We're good. We're, I know. We're, <laughs> Did you always want to come back uh, to the family business, Bo? Yes, I absolutely did. I mean, I think that my actions probably said otherwise, but I was um, I was raised around it, and I've always I've always had a business mindset, and I just I I, I also was wise enough to understand the opportunity. You know, I just I watched my dad growing up. He was constantly constantly involved in the business and uh, i wanted to do the same thing to be honest even though i i went to play football in college and thought maybe there was a career there and and, and tried to work that all out but once that was fully done i uh quickly wanted to be a part of everglades equipment group isn't it what the, position did you play i played quarterback i played wide receiver and i played punter i was actually one of the only guys in uh d1 football at a point that was playing starting quarterback and then i would back up on fourth down and punt the football I bet you that threw a lot of defenses for a loop. I know we talked about it this is. down at the de- at the dinner. Is it the Seminoles or is it uh, the, the Gators. Gators? Who we're a fan of? Yeah. Oh, uh, we're, we're Gators for sure. Gators. Here. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So isn't it the third generation, they say, either drops the ball or makes it happen, you know, goes forward. It sounds like Mike took it the, the right way and actually, as a third generation, didn't drop the ball. So, Bo, like your generation, you should be just like coasting, but uh, uh, you hope to grow it, I guess, too, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. It's funny because I, I heard that growing up a little bit, talking about third generation usually drops the ball. Um, and I think Mike can speak to this. In, in, in any family business, each generation, you just add that much more family layer to the dynamic of the business. And it, um, and in our family business, I think Mike's done a great job from the from the start of everything, just making sure that if you're a family working at Everglades, you, you're here as an employee first and a family member second. You know, you we we, we kind of operate at a certain standard, and if you want to be a part of this, you gotta you gotta follow suit. And I think that's what really allowed these guys in the third generation to, to really do what they did. Cool. cool. My, can, I, can I interject yeah, here? Guys, my earphones died. I apologize. No worries. You're all right. That's fine. Okay. That sounds okay. But but to get back to that point, that is the, the most challenging thing about a family business is a a, the, a perception or, a, or an ex- expectation from family members that, yeah, I'm going to be the boss. I am I I'll tell you one thing was good for me I played sports too and in, in, in college and it was it was, I love the fact that you earned what you got and I'm a fan of that so I, I can tell you this place as long as I'm around it's going to be who's the best person for the job because if it's not about the integrity of the business you're going to lose you know I love having family members involved but I can tell you it's about the integrity of the business and then you plug in and work your way to wherever you want to go that that's that's the good thing. But I like I like the challenge thrown out the bow there. I like that. <laughs> Chief tractor officer. Don't drop the ball, man. Hell yeah. Mike, when you started, uh, when you got that message from John Deere of uh, go or grow, was that all acquisitions or was some of those new locations? That was a, it was a mixture. So it was, um, I'd say about 80% acquisitions. Those first, those first eight stores that they bought. Mike, are you back? Yeah, I'm back. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Now. I'm having technical difficulties, yeah. gentlemen. <laughs> I, I have this question because I started working with my dad, and it's still dad. It's not Dwayne. And my wife was asking, well, when do we start calling them by their name? Like, do you have to be 40 years old? Do you have to be 20 years old? Like, when, when's the time? <laughs> well, he did it to his dad. I grew up listening to him call his dad J.O., and then it's weird because randomly – 
when I turned about 25, I just was like, I'm done calling this guy dad. I'll call him Mike now. But Mike, they want to know when you, when you started to grow, was it acquisitions or was it new stores? It was, uh, the, of the eight, it was acquisitions and one, we built one store here in Loxahatchee. So then the rest of those were acquisitions from other dealers around, around us. So we have basically, as, as we said, north of Orlando, across all the way down through the Keys, there's another ag dealer uh, that's right in the middle of us. Fields Equipment is right in the middle. So they have three locations. But other than that, we're, we cover most of that area pretty good. What did you say? Lots of hatching? I, I was wondering the same thing. What do we call this? Locks of Hatchie, man. That's a Seminole Indian area. You know, that's a that's a good old Seminole Indian name. Locks of Hatchie. Yeah. Hey, it's really it's suburb of West Palm Beach. How about that? That's Very that's much way. easier to understand, right? Because the lake you referenced earlier is Okeechobee, right? Oh, lake Okeechobee. Yeah. That's famous lake. I used to call uh I can't even what's our lake in northern Iowa? I used Okaboji. to call, Yeah, I used to call Okaboji Okeechobee. Oka, Oka yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of people I think that get yeah. those. So our, our listeners uh, also give us a lot of feedback, and some of them love this game that kind of interrupts and creates a transition for us, and others hate it and think it's a waste of time. But <laughs> I'm excited to play a little family feud. We're going to put the Schlechters against the Farm for Profit family. So neither Dave nor Corey know what we've got going on, but are you guys familiar with the family feud game? Oh, I was yeah. Richard Dawson or the new one. I'm Steve both Harvey. Of them. Yes, I am. <laughs> So, top answers out of 100 people surveyed, we are looking for you guys to give me the answers until you get two strikes. It takes too long if we go till three strikes. So, if you get one strike, these guys can steal it back. Two strikes. We'll go back and forth. After the second strike, you give us your answer. So, sure. I'll give you your warning after the first strike. We're going to start off with you guys down there in Florida. Name a place you would never want to hear someone say, oops. <laughs> There are five answers, the top five answers out of 100 people surveyed. Where do you doctor, never want doctor's to? Doctor's office. Yes, doctor's office is the number one answer with 35 points. Bo? I really, I don't know. Um, oops. Uh, at a restaurant. Restaurant is not. An answer. So they get one more wrong. You guys have to jump in and try to steal. Yep. The bathroom. Ooh, that's a good answer, but it is not. <laughs> not one of them. So to steal the 35 points, what do you guys want your answer to be as to where do you not want to hear somebody say We're going to go with the uh, bedroom. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I'm sorry, that is not an oh. answer. Oh. I think we had better ones wrote down. But <laughs> yes. that we had to wrote down. <laughs> so the that answer, was better for the show, though. Yeah. I like that. That was good. The answers that were given were on an airplane, a uh, nuclear no. power plant, in a library, which doesn't make any sense, or during a job interview. Okay. I put work, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. What else did you have on your paper there? You had a uh, I put dentist. Bathroom. Yeah. Work. Uh, like a Uber, okay. a taxi. All right, we're going to flip-flop it here. We're going to let the boys in the studio go first, and you guys get the chance to steal because I know there's no way they're going to get these. <laughs> <laughs> Top five answers of 100 people surveyed. Name, some, name something that you wish grew on trees. Money. Money. Number one answer, 35 points again. Uh, time. Man. Time? Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Time. Is that your answer? I like it. And they got the first one wrong. Next time they get it wrong, you guys get to try and steal. We're looking for four more answers of name something that you wish grew on trees. I mean, I'd say food, but food already grows on trees, right? Like, is it can that? That's can fair. Can it already be on trees? It sure. Food. I will give you credit actually for two of the answers as food. One of the answers was pizza, and one was chocolate. Okay. <laughs> Nothing healthy. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got two answers potentially left. That you yeah, wish grew on Dave. trees and only one strike. Man, I don't. I was thinking toilet paper like uh, COVID. Like oh. was, uh, oh, that's all I had in my mind. Like <laughs> my John Deere tractors, <laughs> which oh. does grow on trees. Yeah. All right, what's your answer? Uh, 
Tractors. Tractors. Girlfriends. Wrong. Uh, Two strikes. Women. <laughs> women. All right. <laughs> Everglades. It's a tough one. Now, I mean, Bo, you go down the food avenue and say, and we can talk. We're talking here. Yeah. Beer. Beer would be a beer would be. Oh, a that would be a good one. Is Bo? that? Depends on the crowd. Yeah, go with beer. I like it. Alcohol is the answer. It is not. Ah. See these guys. We got to pool a different hundred people because the last two answers were clean laundry and Wi-Fi. What? Oh, That's my God. what site? We need to we so need to preface stupid. this with what site he looked this up on. Yeah. This is from Family yeah. Feud. Oh, okay. That's so terrible. we're tied. Everglades got the first one. You guys ended up getting this one. So uh, Everglades, as the guest of the but show, you, you ask the the tiebreakers. Ask the question. We both get an answer, and whoever gets the top one. The top one. Yeah. Okay. Everglades yeah. gets to go like first. It. Okay. Name a food. Do we have to ah. <laughs> yeah, hey, there you go. Yeah. Well, this one where you got to say, distract gotta, him, distract him. Yeah. A little bit of a delay. <laughs> I think we'd win here. Name a food that is sloppy to eat. There are five choices. Say, say that one more time. You, you, name you, a f- name a food that is sloppy to eat. Uh. Everglades gets sloppy to go Joe's. first. Well. I know what sloppy Joe. Slop- I don't think they make those anymore, though. <laughs> that be fair. Sloppy Joe's is that the answer? Yes, that All is right. the number one answer on the so board. So we can't win. What? Can't win. I was gonna say spaghetti. Spaghetti's the number Winner. two answer. Yeah. Uh huh. All right, Everglades wins. What's the last? <laughs> what's the last Thank three? Thank you guys for letting us win. Yeah. I appreciate that. What is the last three? The uh, last three. Anything you eat with your hands, like uh, 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 chicken wings. Oh, yeah. No, ribs. Ooh, ribs. Yeah, ribs, yeah. Choice. Pizza. How is pizza sloppy? I don't know. Depends on, on the pizza. And then chili. So we've got a couple of debates here that the two of you are going to help us out. So oh, yeah. I grew up with a sloppy Joe being called a tavern. Oh, gosh. Is there any North Dakota roots left in you that calls it a tavern? No. 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 It's sloppy no. Joe. That's what we had. <laughs> and sloppy I have Joe. not seen a sloppy, sloppy Joe. Joe in a long time. Not a- not on a plate. I've seen it at out with some of my buddies. I've seen some sloppy joes, but not, not on a plate. I can tell you that. Now. <laughs> well, isn't it in Iowa sloppy joes are made right? Well, it's, there's no that's sauce. Brand. That's just oh, the, there's no yeah. sauce on it. That's just the meat. <laughs> and then the other one was soup slash chili. So Family Feud knows that soup is different than chili, or is chili a soup? Yes. I would classify that, but I would I like my chili on a chili dog, which would become very sloppy to eat. Yeah, <laughs> well, these guys are natural born transition help. Yes. I like it. There you go. Three like rounds it. of Family Feud in as quick a fashion as it's we a possibly much better can game than whatever the other thing was yes. that he was trying to play. Yeah. All yeah. right, Mike. I want to know your family came down and started farming in the area, or is the family still farming in the area? Yes, yes, we are. Now, we, we actually farmed uh, sweet corn, green beans, corn, sugar cane on a couple thousand, maybe 3,000 acres of land up until 2007 when my father ended up selling most of the farm. We still have a half a se- We still have six, a section of land. We still farm uh, 600, 640 acres of land. Now, we rent half of it out, and then we farm half of it, but most of it's in sugarcane, which sugarcane is, uh, is an, I won't say easy, it's an easier crop to grow. It's not very labor intensive, and you run it through a sugar mill, so they do the harvest side of it. So it's pretty, it's not really labor intensive to do, but we needed, when we started growing, we needed a little, uh, uh, some funds along the way. So it really, it worked out really good because it set my dad up where he was good. And, you know, I, decisions I made would not affect him as bad. So it really worked out good for, for both of us. So It's a necessary part of the process is what it sounds like. And But, but I, I will say this, you know, the, the fact that we farmed before we were John Deere dealers. I mean, I've, I've grown crops and the beauty of it is that we understand what a farmer needs and the challenges he goes through. And that, that is really because, I mean, as I, as the John Deere network and probably all of the other uh, manufacturers too, as, as they continue to consolidate and you see, you see all kind of, uh, whether it's, 
you know, private uh, banking or different things that investors get into the dealerships, They're, the mindset's a little different. I mean, I used to walk around and I would see dealerships, guys I've known for years, you know, and then, then you kind of, kind of seeing some faces that you hadn't seen. Not that it's bad, it's just different, you know? So, so I, I like to think, and, and for us, the challenge that I tell our guys is, hey, let me tell you, I want a professional organization with a mom and pop feel. Cause I like that. I think that, I think that makes a difference. You know, it's, it's, Hey, we're going to be, we're going to do things the right way, but I don't want it to feel cold, like a, some corporate climate. Yeah, so yeah. that, that, that's something that I'm trying to make sure our guys do all the time. Bo, I got a question for you and I'm going to start it up by asking Corey and you don't have to answer if you don't want to, cause Mike's on, yeah. but Cor- <laughs> Corey, you come from three generations. Your grandpa farmed, right? Six generations. Six generations. Okay, so you're you guys are very similar. You're farming. Your dealership, Bo. Um, do you, Corey, did you ever feel, or do you still feel like you're in the shadow of your father? Now, your family, your dad has kind of let you take over a little bit, correct? Yeah, a little bit. Um, I was stubborn in the way that I wasn't willing to wait my turn. I didn't want to be taking over the keys when I was 60 years old, when dad wanted to retire okay. you know, or if he wanted to farm till he's dead, that, you know, that was his choice. So, uh, I don't, I don't think I'm typical in that aspect because I started going off and doing my own thing. I mean, I went off the farm, got a job. I, uh, then I, I wanted to come back to the farm. Um, I had all these other ideas that wasn't corn and soybeans, which is our core. And, uh, I mean, I had a list of things. I mean, between different crops, livestock. So you kind of were seed making sales. your own path all around. I, and, 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 and I want to say my grandpa tried, I, I tried to grow a, a berry crop, and which is not very typical for Iowa. And it took a lot of money to get established. And my grandpa wanted to invest in it because oh, okay. he believed in me. He I wanted to help me out. And I wouldn't take his money. Because I got the opportunity to, to farm or plant with Corey the other day, and I felt like you were in charge. And, you know, even your well, dad. I'm the you, CTO. You, your dad, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, Bo, you're you're probably younger than Corey, but do you have uh, visions uh, of where you'd like to take it uh, that, uh, uh, you know, maybe outside of that? I mean, uh, when I remember you at the deal, you were very talkative. You've been awful quiet today because maybe Mike's on the call <laughs> with you. But I, I want you to speak up if I can challenge you a little bit what's what's your dream yeah. what's the dream well i love the question and um i think that to be honest do i feel like i'm in the shadow of my dad and, and also my granddad the answer is absolutely yes and uh because number one like in my my dad would probably say the same thing about his dad like my granddad set such an uh, example yeah, yeah. um and and i would say that i would put my granddad up against anybody in this world when it comes to integrity and honoring the Lord, which is really what his whole life is about. And then my dad, I mean, I would say, I used to say this all the time. Like my dad's one of the best dudes I know. I mean, the guy took a one John Deere dealership to 18. And if you ran around our company, you would see that he is the most loved individual in the company because he's just got the charisma. He's got the know-how he's got the integrity and the discipline um, but make I, no I like mistake. the bonus checks. That's why. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But make make no mistake. If I think if you went around this company today and you asked people, does Bo have his own ideas? I think they would be like, he has too many ideas. Okay. So fair enough. Ideas. Fair enough. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm I'm very confident in in what I bring to the table, and and um, I think that's what's so exciting about this business is. It, it's they grew this thing to be big enough to really where uh, first of all I've got to earn my respect. You know, I came in with a lot of ideas. I have them flowing out of me every day. But you got to understand the business. You know, and every day I'm yep. trying to get better at yep. each department and uh, and earning respect from our employees. But uh, but just like Corey, I got my own ideas too. You know, and I think that's um, it, it's really fun, man. It's really fun. So I do. I am in the shadow, but also. I got plenty to work on. Well, Corey, I'm yeah, guessing this, technology this, changed. You, you know, you brought technology to the table. And actually, Bo, my dad brought technology. Oh, he did. He's, he was the guy. He was building computers like in the '90s. Oh, okay. Like when computers weren't really a thing, and he geeked out on that. He was one of the first in there to have auto steer and all that stuff. So it's actually him and I have a kind of a reverse role because I'm like, 
I love technology. Don't get me wrong, but if it doesn't work, I'm like, no, let's just go like figure it out. And he's willing to take half a day to trace this wire. And I'll be right back, Tanner. But Bo, I I've really enjoyed hearing that you're trying to take it digital because boy, the world in my business is going very digital. So boy, I think you got the right direction there, and I think that melds together with reputation and then digital footprint on top. Man, I, I'm anxious to see what it is when next time we interview you. Well, hey, I'll, so I'll add to that. I'll add to that. When we we've been around certain dealers and we you know we we listen and we talk about uh, market share on the small tractor side, and that's a key indicator for deer and a lot of different things. And I'll tell you this: almost every dealer I talk to has l lost market share last year. We gained market share last year over over what we were before. So we are really right at John Deere's goal for the top dealers. We were right at it. And that's with a cool. that's with a large amount of units. And to me, that's a reflection of of Bo and the marketing department what they've done with the digital side of it, which I don't I don't comprehend. I mean, I understand it from a distance, but he eats it, breathes it, sleeps it, and yes, he has his own ideas, and he'll drive you insane with some of those things. But again, <laughs> to his point, I love it, man. Let's go. Yeah. I like because at some point they have to drive the ship, and I'm good with that. Yeah. You know, I don't. I'm not. That's a good thing that I see. Yep. And 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 you got to point out that, like in our business, you know, there's two segments. There's commercial, right? Your large ag farms and your your large commercial mowing companies in Florida. That's a huge deal. And then on the other side of it, it's all your residential and and the residential, like Mike was pointing out, digital marketing and all that stuff, attracting and creating an expert customer experience. That's all fun, but for you guys. I think some of the more interesting conversations that are going to be had in the future are just how automated oh, are yeah. these farms going to become. You know, I'm sure you guys are talking about that. And that's where my, when I let my thoughts stir up in that world, it gets really, really interesting, you know, because I, I believe that it's going to be full automation. You mm -hmm. know, at some point these farmers are, are going to be sitting back just like we've all, like we've all said, and, and they're going to be kind of watching the robots work and they're going to be tinkering with them. We actually just went to Microsoft about two weeks ago. I got the opportunity to go to Microsoft and hear from the CTO of Microsoft dynamics and hear from the, like um, his boss, which was like 23 years old at Microsoft. He's on the corporate team at Microsoft. He's 23 years old. And he was talking about how essentially right now, AI is kind of your partner, but in the very near future, you are going to be the partner to AI. So it's going to be running the show and you're just going to be making sure it's doing everything right. And um, analyzing that from a farm standpoint is is really exciting stuff. Man, I didn't realize that Microsoft had chief tractor officers. <laughs> 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 I was just going to say, Bo, that it's nice to have a shadow to step into because there's a lot of guests that we've had that are just starting out and they, they are their own shadow. Sometimes they're scared of it because of the opportunity that they're in. But I kind of want to talk about one of the things that you and your crew have introduced is we used to say, everybody's got a podcast and we'd say that tongue in cheek, like, ah, why don't you just invest in ours? Because we've already got the audience that you want and can drive this because a lot of podcasts start with great intentions and stay small and don't have much of an impression. But you and your team have taken and found a niche for content that directly reflects what you're up to and have grown a, a huge following on YouTube to go along with it. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, let's just say this. We, we started our podcast because we truly believe that we work with some of the coolest people in the world. You know, and, and I, I kind of sat around with, like I said, I sit around and I got all these ideas and I got a lot of energy. But one thing I, I, I kept telling our team was, is, look, we need to be on YouTube. We need to be driving content. Right. And, and we started kind of down that road. And then very quickly, we we I was trying to beg my dad for like five years to get what we're calling a YouTube guy and uh, trying to tell all of these guys what a YouTube guy was was very funny. They laughed at me for a solid five years. And then, and then over time, we were able to get that done and get a YouTube guy. When he came in, we said, um, like everyone else does, let's start a podcast. But uh, 
we we really do have a special i asked myself what is the one thing we have that a lot of people don't have and that is access to the biggest farmers in florida and then when you start trickling down to some of the coolest dudes in florida who have these one-off um skid steer businesses and and all of the hard workers through florida and it's all the stuff that you don't get taught in school you know and, and we're really just getting started with our podcast um and we're having to take it pretty dang slow because we can't just use our youtube guy only on our podcast we have a lot of things we're trying to create content wise but uh, we're very excited about that and it's very aligned with what you guys are doing i think that our YouTube guy is a strong believer with myself in that we felt like for the past 10 to 15 years, everybody's hearing about all these other people than the, than the agricultural world. And I think that the world's turning around for a second and being like, wait a second, there's something to this ag world that we need to be talking about because everybody's going to be a doctor, lawyer and all that out of high school. Like that was the big aspiration, but there's uh, other jobs out there, you know, and, and, and people need to hear about them. There's a, there's a whole other world out there. No, it's cool. And, guys, you might not even know this, Bo and Mike, but I just bought a farm, and even I, I'm using Corey as my consultant, and he's helping me. And he even sent me a video on agronomy the other day. We were talking about soil types and whatnot, and uh, it's amazing. He just sent me a video from somebody else, and I've got oh, for I, seed depth. Yeah, seed depth and yep. videos. Uh, they're explaining how deep we should be and everything. Uh, as, as somebody new, and, boy, you're next generation, uh, and, and I'm older, but I'm new to the game, uh, uh, it is crazy how many YouTube videos I've already watched. Yeah, you go to and YouTube University. I, I've been to the dealers that, that do it already, and I'm like, well, what am I supposed to do to prepare my planner? What am I do? So it, it's content curation, not creation. You're going to curate a, a whole environment that, hey, you want to know how to do it? Our company does that. We'll explain it. Yeah, and kudos to yeah. you guys for yeah. hiring that guy. That's Tony that we're talking about, right? That's Tony. Yeah, That's Tony was the first Tony. one we met from yeah. you guys out in the parking lot of Roland Martin's. There was a laptop up bar. on the roof of his yeah. car. Like, Who's yeah, this guy? He was uploading a YouTube <laughs> like, video. I got to get this uploaded before the bus leaves. Yeah. I'm like, what are you doing? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, he's always working. Like, don't good. you have a guy for that? And he he's goes, from. He's I like, am yeah, the guy. And he's got an accent. I'm like, where? You're not from Florida. Yeah. He's from. Yeah. What was he from Boston? Chicago. Or? New York. Yeah, he's, like from, he's from New York City, man, and we bring him right into the, the packing houses of these farms. Oh, my and, goodness. <laughs> and he's, a, he's usually the first one that shows up, and um, they definitely raise their eyebrows when they meet him, but once they get to know him, they love him. And you, isn't it, uh, this is the first place we saw Gus, uh, Global yep. uh, Unmanned Spraying, Spraying Systems. Systems. Yep. Yeah, you guys you guys are like way forward on that. You're right. We we, we were in uh, Tulare, California. Everything is going to be automated. Oh, yeah. It is crazy what tech's going to do, but... Yeah. Yes, it is. It yeah. Really is. Did you move the? Did I hear that you moved the podcast? Is it not directly with Everglades anymore? Are you off from Everglades? Well, we have branched out to the Big Ag Show, and uh, we did that because it, it was very hard. You know, like you guys right now. You know, you can really ask guys anything you want, mm -hmm. and we wanted to have the same honest conversations. And it was very hard to go into our customers and and. Uh, or, or the audience for them to be, feel like we are being authentic while, you know, backed by Everglades. Yep. It's the same. It's all the same company or the same people. But I, I, I told Mike, my dad, I was like, I want to ask the hard questions, you know, and I won't, I don't want people to feel like we're just making commercials for John Deere. You know, even though it is amazing that every time we get into our conversations, our customers are barely, uh, they talk very highly of us, you know, and we don't need a commercial, but, um, we also want to ask him the tough questions. So that's why we did that. That's why we branched off. Right. Probably has a little bit of separation from Mother Deer as well as, as Everglades, yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> covers your butt a little bit. But I, I want to transition into Mother Deer on that. Like you, Mike, you've been with this for a long time. There's obviously – it's just like the seed business, right? Like everyone's got good seed. Um and there's a lot of other good color tractors out there as well, but there's something that keeps coming back with John Deere that just makes it part of the community, helps you guys be what you, you know, the business that you need to be. What, what are some of the highlights from your years with John Deere? And why does it make it busy, easy for you guys? Well, I'll tell you, I mean, John Deere has been an excellent partner and, you know, and again, I've done it 35 years and, you know, again, we've been in longer than that, but John Deere is an excellent partner. And, I, and, and you know, to your point that, you know, a lot of people make good equipment, you know, 
deer will say that their dealer network makes the difference. And I and I'll tell you, and I'll tell you a funny story. We went to a customer one time. We had he had a track, uh, a two track machine, and the front uh, idler was breaking, kept breaking. He was he was uh, pulling ditches, so he was kind of it was kind of putting pressure that probably was a little. But, but I took, went, so I get my guy from John Deere, the service rep, said, let's go. We're going to go out here and, and uh, talk to this customer. So we get out there, and he's got his little notepad out, you know. And the customer says, uh, look, look at this. Look at the design of this. What are we going to do? I said, we're going to pay for it. We're going to do whatever we have to do, and we're going to make it right. We're going to fix that. The John Deere guy took his notepad and just threw it up in the air. He said, okay, I guess that's what we're doing. But, you know, in reality, we are the difference between the manufacturer and the cu on the customer. If we don't do what we're supposed to do, and you could probably see that in any color, if you don't have a good dealer, it's not going to work. Because right. we 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 fix the, the the manufacturer's deficiencies. You know, now I will say this, John Deere has has changed somewhat even with the dealer network where there's, you know, it's consolidated on the dealer network, but even Deere has changed to you know, with the technology and different things, you know, they talk about their uh, software engineers and all these different things, you know, and it's I, I, it's great. But I the only scare or, or fear I have a little bit is losing perspective of of what at the end of the day, technology is awesome. You still have equipment. You still have uh, cut uh, customers out there doing just what you guys are talking about. That out there are figuring out the most efficient way to do things. And if you ever lose perspective of I'm a software company or a technology company, which is great, but you still manufacture equipment and it better be solid and it better be good. And the importance of the dealer in that in that whole scenario is when John Deere messes up, when Case messes up, when anybody messes up somebody's got to fix that problem and sure. i think that's where we have been pretty good over the years is when deer has issues we stand in the gap and and take care of it and i think and again that's not that's not lip service that's it's cost us some money in the in, a, in a, a lot of times but we also understand agriculture we farm we understand what it takes and i'm gonna tell you i'm a big fan of it. if it's right it's right if it's wrong, it's wrong. I don't you can paint it any way you want to, but that's the fact. Hey, Mike, I want to ask you, uh, as a salesman myself that sells farmland, um, what do you what do you got for advice for me, for Bo, for other people? You know, I like technology. I like it moving forward, but it is still a handshake business, and it is people do business with people they like and trust. You got a lot of experience in there. What's your what's your what's your advice for me and Bo? Well, I'm going to tell you that's he he kind of touched on it before. Uh, it stems from my my dad and his dad before him is integrity. Let me tell you, if you don't have integrity, you, you have nothing because farmers uh, people people talk about farmers. Da, da, da. Let me tell you, farmers one of the smartest guys on the planet because he makes you think that he don't understand it and he understands he understands everything all you of say it and he gets it. So he's going to give you this. I don't know, but. but he he can spot that if you if you're not being who you're supposed to be with integrity he gets it and you're and you're done, you know I, I think you guys are very wise to be getting in land I can tell you that that's good stuff and and let me tell you we went through tough times in the economy and different things people had to eat so for us you know the the focus on our agricultural side of our business will never change we actually brought another guy in. That is our division manager just for ag. So that's how important we think it is. Now, now you mentioned earlier about corn and soybeans. That's one thing I don't like about John Deere. All they think about is corn, corn and soybeans. <laughs> and I'm probably gonna get in trouble saying this, but that and, and look, I understand it's 100 million acres of land, you know. So yeah. I understand it, but sometimes it's frustrating. I'll be on a call with John Deere and, and the the guys talking about, well, we're about to start planting and we're finishing. You know what I'm saying? Because our season is opposite of theirs. But I don't know. It's actually it's closer okay. to 200 but That's one acres. thing that's challenging. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to make the point. I got to make this point. I hear a lot of the people from the outside of John Deere, all they really focus on is the tractor and, and you know, the things, you know, the tractor versus that tractor. But I will say this. From a young guy, you know, I'm 32. And um, John Deere 
what most people don't see is they are an amazing company internally. Those dudes and gals are constantly pressing the edges of everything they can get their hands on. You know, we go to, I'm a part of a, a dealer association that's for all colors. And when I talk to these guys, they're constantly saying like, hey, we should make a conference to learn these things. And maybe we should have a focus group. And, and every time I'm sitting there when I represent deer and I'm like, we already got that, guys. I mean, John yeah, that's Deere Larry. internally. Yeah. Yeah. John Deere internally is is saying, how can we make your business system better? How can we make your marketing better? What does your website look like? What does your sales team need to sell better? What are your parts guys doing? What is your service doing? Hmm. I mean, they're just pushing at all angles. And then on top of that, with this whole technology piece, it's a double-edged sword because they are gearing up for the future. And just like you were pointing out was people buy off of handshakes and friends today and they surely do. And that's not going to change, but we all know that we buy a lot of things from Amazon today that there isn't any old one of our buddies that would sell us. If they, no, no, we're buying that from Amazon because it's just too easy. They got my credit card at two clicks is here tomorrow. And we're just, John Deere does a great job of finding the balance or they're trying to do a great job of finding the balance of we, we got to make sure that we don't get out automated by somebody while at the same time, we Never still want to make sure our dealers yeah. provide that level of friendly help in each community. Yeah. You know, and I think John Deere does an excellent job at that. I will say Van Wall, our local dealer has, they were probably before Amazon kind of had the Amazon mentality of like, Oh, you need a part, but it's not at the store and it's nine in the morning. It'll be here at three in the afternoon. Cause I got the route truck always constantly going. Well, yeah. Even in their app, I, I've been looking at it, you know, in their equipment app. When you look at their equipment app, you can order parts right there in your account and have it. And it already knows your equipment, you know, because I've saved it there. So they, they've made strides to make it more yeah. Amazon-esque. We got to spend time out in Larry at the World Ag Expo with Larry, who I think y'all are headed to Nashville for this conference that you were talking about, the internal yep. teach you, educate yep. you. He's the one that organizes that. But okay. we, we also got to meet Greg. Mm-hmm who's in charge of the high value crops division. And, and it is fascinating that John Deere is putting more emphasis in those areas. Is it getting all the emphasis? No, uh, not happening, but it's going that way. So they must've heard you, Mike, because uh, it seems like there's a lot more resources going that way than there were in the past. Yeah, I, I agree. I had that. I was at the CEO summit and that was, they kind of put me on the spot. So I got to ask the CEO of John Deere that question. And, and he, they, they mentioned that and I met, that gentleman was out there as well. So yeah. that, hey, look at, I think I think you've got the technology. It's just how you disperse it amongst the, amongst the divisions. It's it's yeah. look, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. They they put the time and effort in developing the technology. Just let's get it let's get it to the ground. Guys, not to what? go for it. No, because you know I'm going to wrap. Oh, I was going to say, go not to change the direction, but we, we've talked all about your business and all about that. Do you have hobbies? Do you <laughs> like fishing? Like, like, what do you guys do? We're like, keeping them like, out of the pool. You I, told we're us keeping that. them out of the pool? <laughs> I mean, like. <laughs> <laughs> Bo, I'll let you go, Bo. What's your Bo's favorite whiskey? Be working. He has three kids. Yeah. He better be working and taking care of three kids. Uh, I would say about Mike's hobbies, guys. He's uh, When he's a businessman at business, that he's all business, but when he goes home, okay, he's not afraid to have some of those beverages you got on your table. Uh, number one, he's he loves the pool. He, you know, he he owns a boat, but he never fishes on it. He uh, just dances on it. Dance. Really I, like it. it. I like it. I like now, it. Now, now we're getting a little all basic. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. They said they could edit this, okay? Yeah. yeah hey, I like to golf. Golfing is my thing. That, that, that to me, is what's yeah. what I do in my free time. I go golfing. I got a good group of guys, and we go, we go, and I don't have to work, think about anything. I just get to, we get to have fun and play golf and hit that little white ball around. It's good stuff. You that's, can golf year-round there. We have to have a simulator oh, yeah. here <laughs> that we have to simulate golf in the wintertime. <laughs> yeah, y'all, y'all, well, for us, actually, it's funny because – the summertime is brutal down here, oh, yeah. golfing in the summertime. But, I mean, we still do it. But it, most time it rains in the summer. But it is it is tough in the summer. Now, I will say days like today, fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. So, I know yeah, we're – And if you – I, I just want to point out, if you guys ever get a chance to come down to South Florida, we do want to put you on a boat, take you down to the East Coast in Palm Beach, and ride you down the intercoastal and show you the houses from here to Jupiter Island where all the golfers live. It's a special, Let's do it. special scene. 
I like Let's do that. it. Let's do another sugar trip and then just extend on a, several yeah. days. Turn, there. turn into an Everglades experience. Yep. 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 Make content galore. I like that. Yep. Well, we started 15 minutes late. And we went longer than I told you I did. <laughs> so we thank you. We really appreciate this. We hope you had as much fun as we did. Yeah, it's good stuff, yeah. guys. Listen, I, I, you know, I watched a little bit. I did a little pre-work myself. And let me tell you, I think more information about what people do in the agricultural world needs to be out there. So yeah. let me tell you, I commend you guys. It's good stuff. Thank good you. Stuff. And, and you have fun while you're doing it. So that, that's always even better. So yeah. good stuff. We have to have fun. We've said from the beginning, when it becomes not fun is probably when we stop doing it. Yep. That's yeah. that's what I said about this job too. It's getting close to being no fun. Now. <laughs> oh, that's awesome! All right, if people are curious, I want to know from you, Mike, how they can find Everglades, and then Bo, I want to know from you how they can find the content. See, that would be the how they find Everglades is a much better thing, discussion for Bo. I can tell you that now, Bo. You need to tell them how they can find Everglades. I like. There that. you go. Double answer, Bo. Let me tell you, if you want to find Everglades, you just go online and type in Everglades Equipment Group, and uh, you will surely find us. And I do—I just want to do one plug here, guys. You know, you do yeah. got the big ag show. We talked about that, but we just launched our new uh, online steel power equipment shopping cart. So anywhere in the country right now, if you want to buy a battery-powered steel a uh, piece of power equipment you can buy it from everglades farm ah. equipment.com go, oh, cool. go there and get your steel battery equipment wow that's cool i didn't even know that was a thing yeah. and and bo you got socials uh, so for our listeners very social guys uh what are your socials uh, everglades equipment group anywhere any platform you'll find us okay i will tell you one thing one piece of advice that i have is you gotta abbreviate the email addresses i looked at that <laughs> i was like and all the that's- words at Everglades yeah. equipment. We did. We did. You know what? That is that is a incredible point, and we did it. So it's now mine would be Mike at efe nineteen sixty three That was that was, long that was that was look. That was one of the things that I thought about too. It's insane. So <laughs> now instead of dot ever or Everglades Farm Equipment, it's efe nineteen sixty three. Any of our people, uh, efe nineteen sixty three But great. Great suggestion. Well, <laughs> Mike, as you're watching, as you're watching Bo uh, grow the whole uh, digital deal, one thing we've learned on the podcast, and one thing that I've learned in my business is relatable is everything. So at first, I thought this might be a bad idea, but you know what? Farmers like this too. So uh, where I was a little cautious to start with, um, even John Deere has been very gracious with us in, in in content that I thought might be right there, and it's been wonderful because people are relatable it's got to be relatable it makes it that handshake deal digitally it's 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 the real world i mean it's real people we're not dealing with machines yet yeah Yeah. that's exactly right yep that's right (laughs) well gentlemen thanks again we greatly appreciate it and uh our audience we thank you as listeners for hanging out there with us please like rate review and share go check these guys out uh we we didn't have them on by any professional obligation. We did because of our experience with Bo at that supper and the crew. And uh, clearly, I think you witnessed by the people that they are and the stories that they have that they're a lot of fun. But, Corey, what do you tell the listeners? Say crack a bush light. You deserve it. <laughs>